you beautiful bastards. Hope you having a fantastic Wednesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today is an interesting controversy around a thing that really is responsible for me even having a career in the first place. Questionable clickbait. And while my early days YouTube clickbait was look at this very attractive woman instead of my stupid face kind of clickbait, the clickbait and controversy we're talking about today revolves around this thumbnail. It's a thumbnail for a creator by the name of Mr. Beast, an absolutely massive creator on the platform. In fact, this video that we're talking about today as of recording has over 32 million views and it was only just uploaded on July 28th. But the video is called Can 20,000 Magnets Catch a Bullet Midair? And the thumbnail appears to show Mr. Beast firing an AK at his friend who is understandably shocked and uh, in the background potentially the only thing stopping the bullet is this wall of magnets. Now when you actually go into the video that as of right now has over 400,000 likes and over 150,000 dislikes, this does not happen. Which I will say, this is one of the only instances where I'm like, oh thank god it's clickbait. Instead what we see in the video is an AK being used to shoot through several different types of products. And here there's no one on the other end of the bullet, which good. And then regarding the situation of shooting in front of that wall of magnets, one, at no point is anyone on the other end of a weapon. And two, they briefly try to use the AK here, realize not anything really interesting is going to happen. And so for the most part during this segment, they actually just use a BB gun. So that is the situation. That is what actually happened. So where is the controversy? Well, one, there's the fear that even though this is obvious clickbait, if you are a fan of of Mr. Beast, there is a concern that even though no one in the actual video fired a weapon at another human being, the people are going to see the thumbnail, see that it attracted a lot of views, go, okay, well, what if I escalate and we actually do something like this? And then someone gets hurt or killed because this thumbnail promoted a dangerous trend. And the thing is, someone being hurt or killed in that manner, that's not even a hypothetical situation. That's a story we've talked about for over a year. Mona Lisa Perez, Pedro Ruiz the Third, he got her to shoot at him with a desert eagle. He held a book in front of his chest thinking it would stop the bullet. It did not. But I will say my personal reaction to somehow holding Mr. Beast accountable for maybe someone else not just clickbaiting, but actually physically doing what appears to be happening in his thumbnail, I feel like that's an incredible stretch. But there's also the second argument that thumbnails like this should not exist and should definitely not be a part of videos that are promoted by YouTube. And with the specific video that we're talking about, many people said that it was actually in their recommended feed. Well, the thing is, looking at actual YouTube policy, I think this video exists in its perfect gray area. YouTube policy on real, dramatized, or fake violence. The policy here seems focused focused on the actual video itself and does not cover thumbnails. And at no point during the video does someone point a firearm at another human being. So then you look to YouTube's thumbnail policy where they seemingly have a focus on sexually provocative thumbnails, but also adding that the thumbnail in general should be appropriate for all ages and saying, please select the thumbnail that best represents your content. Which you could say, okay, well, there wasn't a person on the other end. On the note of does the thumbnail represent what you actually see in the video? Uh, well, there are the differences that I mentioned before, but there is also the defense that the thumbnail is also part of the joke. That a lot of the content on Mr. Beast's channel in general, embraces memes, kind of talks about clickbait culture. Right, the thumbnail is part of the content and we've seen examples of that in the past. For example, we've talked about instances in the past where you had a creator by the name of iDubs TV putting out a video called Content Cop Jake Paul, but it turned out it was actually a video on another creator by the name of Rice Gum. But the thumbnail, the misleading, that was part of the content itself. Now that video initially was slapped down by YouTube, but ultimately it ended up getting fixed. And so if I was Mr. Beast's internet lawyer, I would argue, well, that's not a complete apples to apples comparison, that it is in the fruit category, that that would be the argument in general to have. And the thing is, I have to imagine with the number of views this video got, YouTube has to be aware of this situation and seemingly if they have not acted on it, they are fine with it. I mean, hell, the reason we're talking about this today isn't just because you go to the comments section and there are people talking about the clickbait and what, what was actually happening in the video, but also because it was picked up by places like Polygon who have now reached out to YouTube for comments. As far as the online audience, like I said, there were 150,000 plus dislikes, but there were over 400. 100,000 likes. It's also important to note that the Mr. Beast channel is not the only one doing this. A quick search brings up examples of other channels doing similar things. And since this video came out on the 28th, the channel has gained 400,000 new subscribers. But with all of that said, my personal opinion out of the way now, I pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts here? When it comes to thumbnails like this, clickbait like this, do you think that it is something that should be cracked down on? Or no, do you think this is an example of people making a problem where there is none? Why, why not? Any and all opinions, I'd love to hear from you. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in awesome and brought to you by betterhelp.com slash DeFranco. And BetterHelp, if you do not know, is the fantastic place and service where you can get affordable private online counseling. Right on your computer or phone, you get access to licensed, trained, experienced, accredited psychologists. Also marriage and family therapists, clinical social workers, and board licensed professional counselors. And all you've gotta do is go to betterhelp.com slash DeFranco, you fill out a questionnaire, they match you with a counselor, and you can start counseling today. And on a personal note, yes, they are a sponsor, but it's also a service
service I use. It's a service that I feel like has given me tools to help navigate my life. But main point with that said, if this sounds interesting to you, you want to try it out, just go to betterhelp.com slash DeFranco. And the first bit of awesome, we haven't done this in forever, but kind of just a fun random thing. In the next 20 hours, I will select one person that goes to my Twitter, twitter.com slash and they retweet my tweet for this video. It'll be the tweet up at the top that I have pinned, and one random person will be selected to get $500. And as a small stipulation, you have to have created the Twitter before today. But yeah, just a random thing. Good luck to you. Then we had Kate McKinnon and Mila Kunis playing a game of How Well Do You Know Your Co-Star. Then we had NCT127 teaching you Korean slang. Then Vogue gave us 73 questions with Tiffany Haddish. You got a chef attempting to make gourmet Oreos on Bon Appetit. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then let's talk about a massive update to the story around Tommy Robinson in the UK. And to bring you up to speed, if you didn't see our past coverage, here's a little TLDR. You've got Tommy Robinson, an outspoken critic of the UK's immigration practices. He's a founder of the English Defense League, but he also left that group in 2013, claiming he couldn't keep the extremist elements at bay. He's against Muslim immigration to the UK, saying Islam is not compatible with the customs and cultural norms of the country. Many critics have labeled him a bigot and racist. And as you might remember, in May of this year, Robinson was found in contempt of court. And this was actually the second time he was found in contempt of court in a year, since back in May 2017, he actually received a suspended three-month sentence. But regarding his 2018 contempt conviction, that was a result of him filming outside Leeds Courthouse. Specifically, he was filming and commenting on a group of Muslim men accused of grooming children for a sex ring. And that specific trial had a gag order. No one was supposed to report or talk about the trial. There was a fear that the jury would be influenced. And about an hour after starting his live stream outside of the courthouse, Robinson was arrested. And what ended up happening is he was charged with contempt of court. He admitted to the charges. He deleted the video. And within five hours of his arrest, he was sentenced to 10 months in prison. And because, as I mentioned earlier, he had a three-month suspended sentence that was then added on top. And following this arrest, we saw a lot of people outraged by these charges and what transpired, saying it was a ploy by authorities to jail a critic of theirs. Additionally, even though Robinson had a 13-month sentence, many people said that this was a death sentence. Many fearing that Robinson would be harmed in the prison system by Muslims that Robinson has been outspoken against. We also saw Robinson appeal both of his contempt of court charges. Which brings us to today, because at a hearing in London, Lord Chief Justice Lord Burnett has reversed Robinson's contempt of court conviction from this year. Robinson's lawyers argued that the proceedings in Leeds Crown Court were biased and unfair to Robinson, adding that procedural deficiencies had caused prejudice at the court. Saying one, Robinson was given no time to set up a defense. Two, the judge never fully explained how Robinson's actions could have potentially prejudiced the jury. And three, the judge may have been biased in his actions against Robinson and let his bias over Robinson's actions get in the way of how proceedings should have been done. Arguing what should have happened is Robinson is arrested and informed he was arrested for contempt of court. The judge then should have adjourned the matter and let Robinson prepare a defense. Then at the same time, the judge would have referred this to the attorney general who then decides whether or not to proceed and press charges. And then Robinson would return to court and decide whether to plead guilty or go further with court proceedings and defend himself. And Lord Burnett ended up agreeing, saying that Robinson will face new and fair court proceedings with a new judge at the Old Bailey. This reportedly as soon as reasonably possible. And it appears a big reason for Burnett making this decision is that no particulars of the contempt were formulated or put to Robinson, adding there was a muddle over the nature of the contempt being considered. Or in layman's terms, the previous judge never properly clarified how what Robinson did was contempt of court. And following this decision, as you might imagine, there were very different reactions. Reportedly in the courtroom, supporters erupted in applause. Meanwhile, outside, we saw two competing groups of people. You had the groups that were supporting Robinson, and then you had anti-Robinson groups like Stand Up to Racism. Both, though, were reportedly outnumbered by police who were there to keep them apart. You saw Robinson supporters wearing shirts like Free Tommy, chanting He's Coming Home. And on the other side, you had people chanting things like Nazi scum, Say It Loud, Say It Clear, Refugees Are Welcome Here, and also chanting We all saw UKIP leader Gerard Batten tweeting out, A word of appreciation for the appeal court today. They held up the best traditions of English law, fair and impartial. But the conduct of the judge in the Leeds case needs looking at. That wasn't fair or impartial. And we also saw a good number of people happy about the ruling, despite not necessarily being supporters of Robinson. You had people like actor Alex Andro tweeting, I am delighted that our legal system seeks to offer protection to all, including Tommy Robinson. I am proud to live in a country which offers all citizens the very rights fascists like Robinson would seek to deny me. A civilized society is judged by how it treats the uncivil. We also saw Shahab Khan, a journalist for The Independent, tweet, Proud that I live in a country where the legal system is fair for all, irrespective of who you are and where you were from. Tommy Robinson being released shows all citizens are treated fairly, contradicting the far right's bizarre conspiracy that the state is against them. But also pushing against that, to paraphrase the general mindset, people pointed out that the supposed fair for all system is the reason why Robinson seemingly was railroaded directly to prison. Although then you get into a debate of individuals in a system rather than the system itself. But moving forward, as far as what did 
Robinson have to say after all of this? Well, he ended up refusing to speak to reporters after being released, saying, Why would I? Why would I have anything to say to you? All you do is lie. You've lost. You, hold on. You've lost the. You've lost okay, the faith. No, I'm just the, asking you a question. You've lost that's the all. faith of the British public. What? What? The no, media I'm, generally. Or? All the mainstream media do is like. Yeah, I've got a lot to say. Yeah. Nothing to you. I just have a thank you to the British public for their support. But finally, one of the biggest things I do want to point out is that Robinson isn't out of the woods yet. It's not that he was released and he's free now and it's all over. Right now he's only out on bail. He still has these new proceedings at the Old Bailey now. And with those proceedings, many still believe that he is likely to be found in contempt. But even with that, it is possible that his sentence might be less, considering one of the major criticisms of his last sentence was that it was too harsh for the crime. But ultimately, we're going to have to wait to see what happens next. But with all of that said, I do want to pass the question off to you. What is, what is your take away from this situation? Are you happy that Robinson is out now, that there will be new proceedings? Or no, do you feel like this new decision is a mistake? And I'll also pass off the final question with this story because it got really interesting the last time we talked about this Tommy Robinson situation. Do you feel like gag orders for the press should be a thing regarding legal proceedings? Do you feel that it is the suppression of speech and information? Or no, do you think that it is the right thing to do to keep juries from being prejudiced? I'd love to know your thoughts here and your reasoning. As I've expressed in past videos, I do not like really any limitations regarding what our free press does. But regardless of whatever side you have in this story, I'd love to hear from you. Then let's talk about this whole situation that popped up this morning with Donald Trump, Jeff Sessions, Robert Mueller, also Manafort. And the reason we're talking about this is this morning, Trump tweeted out an alleged quote from his supporter, Alan Dershowitz, where he criticized the Mueller investigation and then said, this is a terrible situation and Attorney General Jeff Sessions should stop this rigged witch hunt right now before it continues to stain our country any further. Bob Mueller is totally conflicted and his 17 angry Democrats that are doing his dirty work are a disgrace to USA. And if you're wondering, he just recently changed it from 13 to 17. And following that tweet, of course, there was a massive reaction because to many it appeared that the President of the United States on Twitter told the top law enforcement official in the country to kill the Russia investigation. But I also will know that that doesn't necessarily make sense because he already recused himself from the investigation. Technically speaking, in that sort of direct way that seems to be referenced here, he couldn't do that. But either way, there was still the question of why did the President issue this order online? To which Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders said he didn't. Uh, it's not an order. It's the president's opinion. And I will personally say, based off of how President Trump generally operates, it, it doesn't really appear like it's an actual order. This to me seems more like Trump's continued and never ending effort to attack the credibility of Mueller and his team. Because as we've stated in the past, Trump can say whatever he wants about Jeff Sessions and that he shouldn't have recused himself, but at any time, Donald Trump could end the investigation himself. But I believe the president is aware with the Congress that we have right now, Congress would then turn against him. But of course, it's important to note with the Congress we have right now. As more and more Republicans are realizing with these primaries, Donald Trump right now very much controls the Republican Party. And I don't just mean because he's the president, I mean based off of who he endorses in the primaries, those people just surge through the polls. Now obviously a thing to keep in mind is in, let's say, some purple states or highly contested states, it, it might not be the best. And so through this, he's locking more and more solid allies in Congress. Meanwhile, there's still the continued swipes at Bob Mueller. And the thing is, with Trump supporters, he has been incredibly effective, right? If you're not with him, it's a hoax, it's a witch hunt, you're you're lying, you're the enemy of the people. I mean, just so you understand, the person that he has cast doubt upon here, Robert Mueller, he's a Republican heavily decorated veteran. He served as a Marine during the Vietnam War, he got a Bronze Star, he got a Purple Heart. He was nominated for the position of FBI Director by a Republican. He was appointed unanimously. I mean, that's a level of person leading this investigation, and Donald Trump has effectively turned it into like the 17 angry Democrats argument. And based off of everything the president has put out there, I, I really feel he's just waiting for the numbers to make sense. So there's that. But also another thing to consider is the timing of this tweet. While President Trump has played this tune before, it is also incredibly important to note that today is the second day that Paul Manafort is on trial. And in fact, this morning, Donald Trump tweeted about Manafort as well, saying, Paul Manafort worked for Ronald Reagan, Bob Dole, and many other highly prominent and respected political leaders. He worked for me for a very short time. Why didn't government tell me that he was under investigation? These old charges have nothing to do with collusion, a hoax. And for those that aren't familiar with what Paul Manafort is going through right now, he's not actually on trial for collusion. In a separate trial, he's facing charges related to money laundering and illegal lobbying, but in this trial happening right now, he's specifically charged with bank and tax crime. In total, there are 18 counts against him, which can be split into two categories. The first category is tax scheme, where Manafort hid the money that he was making from working in Ukraine. And the second category is financial institution scheme, where Manafort lied to banks to receive loans. Meanwhile, Manafort's defense is blaming Rick Gates, saying that he embezzled and turned state's witness to protect himself. And once again, hitting on the note that this doesn't seem to be about collusion, during pretrial arguments,
arguments, the prosecution actually said that they would not bring up Manafort's work on the Trump campaign. And their one exception here is one witness reportedly from a bank that gave him a loan in exchange for consideration for a position in the administration. But also on that note, the defense doesn't want any mention of Trump. Their argument being that any mention could influence the jurors against Manafort if they already had a negative view of the president. But ultimately, that is where we are with the situation right now, and it will be interesting to see how this evolves. But of course, there's a story, there's my opinion, and I pass the question off to you. What do you feel about all of this? What do you think and why all the good stuff? Let me know in the comments down below. And that's where we're going to end today's show. And of course, remember, I want this to be a conversation, so whether it be the last story, the first one, anything in between, let me know what you're thinking in those comments down below. And of course, remember, if you like today's show, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button, ring that bell to turn on notifications. Also, if you missed yesterday's daily show, you want to catch up, click or tap right there to watch that. Or maybe you want something lighter, you want to watch the newest behind the scenes vlog, you can click or tap right there. But that's it, of course, as always, my name is Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love your faces and I'll see you tomorrow.